We will turn our attention to chapter 5 in our textbook, which deals with the finite wing theory. So let me switch to a full screen mode so that uh, we could uh, see the entire screen. Until now, in our book, we have looked at uh, some building blocks such as sources and sinks and doublets and free stream and vortices. So with those very, very simple basic building blocks, we were able to put together geometries such as a Rankine's half body, which is a half of an ellipse, Rankine's full body, which looks like an elliptical shape or an oval shape. Using doublet and free stream, we were able to construct flow over a circular cylinder. Then we added a vortex, then we were able to produce lift. And we came across a theorem called Kutajukowski theorem, which is a lift per unit span, Newton per meter, equals density times free stream velocity times circulation. So this was the Kudajukowski theorem. Then in chapter four, we went to the thin aerofoil theory. We modeled the aerofoil just by the camber line. So we distributed vortices all along the card line from leading edge to trailing edge. These represent the circulation actually over the camber line because the camber line is a curved line, hard to integrate, so we put it along a straight line. The assumption being camber is so small, one or two percent curved camber line can be approximated with a straight line. So on each one of these camber line, we put tiny vortices, delta gamma, which is a gamma times d c. Then we came up with an integral equation, then we integrated it and solved for 2D lift, CL, and 2D pitching moment. We could not get a drag in two dimensions because um, drag is a poten potential flow, 2D potential flow is zero, so-called D'Alembert's paradox. Now we turn our attention to three-dimensional wings or the finite wings. Why do we want to look at 3D wings, uh, what's wrong with 2D aerofoil that we studied in chapter four? The answer is as follows. When people started building wings, uh, you know, as you know, the Wright brothers uh, built their first airplane in 1903. So over a period of time, people were starting to build gliders. Then they started building, once the piston engines were more powerful, they started building the airplanes. So First World War, 1914 to 1918, they were already using uh, biplanes, just like the Wright brothers. Then they got rid of uh, all the connectors. They went from biplane to single plane. They replaced the uh, fabric like foils, thin foils, with the metal skin. And they put the structural support inside the wing. So the wing started looking like the modern day airplane wing. So they started building airplanes. So a lot of this was taking place by trial and error process. But they noticed uh, two things. One is if they use the theory CL equal to two pi times alpha minus alpha naught, if the two pi as a lift curve slope, the theory prediction of the chapter four theory produced too high a lift compared to what was measured. In other words, a finite wing is producing less lift than a 2D aerofoil made of an infinitely long wind will do, okay, even per unit span. So they didn't know what was causing this loss of lift. Secondly, they found that the drag of the finite wing was much higher than the 2D drag that you will get from a viscous flow theory, something like our X-foil. They didn't have X-foil at the time. They had some empirical relationships for flat plate so they found the drag was much higher. So two things are going wrong. One, the lift was too little. Two, the drag was too high. So they wanted to understand what's going on. So Germans went to Prantl in Germany, asked him to come up with some explanation of what's going on. In Germany, they already had aircraft manufacturers, you know, companies that we know like Dornier, that we know now, uh, 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 these, these people were building airplanes. Likewise, in uh, England, uh, people came to a person called Lanchester and asked him to come up with a model. So Prandtl and Lanchester on different sides of the 
the English Channel were developing a theory. They did not talk to each other. First of all, because there was a language barrier. Uh, Prandtl spoke only German, Lanchester spoke only English, British English at that. Secondly, there was always this war going on, like the First World War was going on. So things didn't uh, get communicated between the two countries. So much later, in, uh, it came to be known that both these same gentlemen, Lanchester and Prandtl, had come up with the same idea independently. So the theory we are developing in this chapter is called Prandtl Lanchester model. It's got two purposes. You want to be able to predict the lift, not just the overall wing lift, which is useful, but also how is the lift distributed all over the wing from one wing tip to the other one. And why is it lower than 2D theory is giving me. Secondly, we want to know what is this extra drag that is happening above and beyond the viscous drag that we have already seen caused by the skin friction. So these are the two things that these two scientists were looking at. So here is the 2D theory from chapter four, CL equal to two pi times alpha minus alpha naught. Alpha is in radians, alpha naught is in radians. Alpha naught is called the zero lift angle or zero lift angle of attack. Two pi is the lift curve slope. We also know that the pitching moment at the quarter card is a constant. The quarter card, therefore, is called the aerodynamic center. And it only depends on the camber line shape. So in our worked out examples in chapter four, we were dealing with things like A1 and A2 to compute the pitching moment. A1 and A2, if you look back, they are functions of only the slope of the camber line, dz, dx. So we, 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 we can get more accurate solutions from CFT or from panel method, but these principles do not change for 2D. And we also showed that the 2D lift curve will look like this. It's a nice straight line if you use just two pi times alpha minus alpha naught. The black line is the actual line, the actual test data. Notice that the slope starts changing because of the boundary layer growth, the aerofoil shape just starts changing. The outer flow, potential flow now is outside the boundary layer. At higher and higher angles of attack, the boundary layer is thicker. So it's changing the basic shape of the aerofoil, changing the camber line, the effective camber line. Therefore, you're getting less and less lift. And of course, some point the flow separates, you get stopped. Pitching moment, likewise, is uh, independent of angle of attack for a long time. Then you get a moment stall at positive alpha, upper surface separates. Moment stall, negative alpha, when the lower surface separates. Again, positive alpha, upper surface stall. Negative alpha, the lower surface stall. The intercept of this curve with the x-axis is called the angle of zero lift or a zero lift angle of attack also called alpha naught in our notes. The drag polar we could not get from our chapter four. We had to go back to the boundary layer theory, flat plate theory, empirical relationships, and things like that, like Twait's method and Hertz method and so forth. So these are all 2D. So as I mentioned to you, when they applied this to wings, the slope was much less than this slope. When we applied it to wings, the drag was much higher than the 2D drag. So industries came to Prandtl and Lanchester asking for some kind of an explanation of what's going on. This is, for example, a type of data that X5 will produce. Horizontal axis is CD, vertical axis is CL. As a function of Reynolds number, notice that the lower Reynolds number, you have 1 over either square root of Reynolds number or 1 over Reynolds number raised to the power 0.2. So the higher the Reynolds number, lower the drag. We, you have already computed shapes like this in your x file project. This is the CL versus alpha. This is the CM versus alpha. This is an aerofoil, typical aerofoil. This is a, one of the laminar aerofoils that was designed long time ago. So coming back to 3D wings, as I mentioned to you in the beginning, 
3D wings tend to have a lower lift coefficient, really a lower lift curve slope. It's not 2 pi, it's something less than 2 pi. They also have a higher drag coefficient. It's not just the viscous drag, there's something more is going on. Also, they found that the smaller the aspect ratio, the aspect ratio is the span squared, meter squared, divided by the projected wing area, capital S, which is also in meter squared. So the aspect ratio is a non-dimensional number. So the smaller the wing aspect ratio, higher was the drag, higher was the lift loss. That means the lower the lift curve slope. So as I mentioned to you, Lanchester in England, 1907, right after Wright Brothers started flying, 1903, people were building airplanes and they needed a theory. So England, you know, Lanchester was doing this work. Prandtl had done a theory in Germany right after the World War I. Uh, both of them finally uh, realized they were working on the things together. So we are going to explain what's going on in this particular theory. This theory allows the aircraft designers, we should remember this is limited to unswept wing. That means if you sweep a wing, you cannot use this theory. You have to go to something called a lifting surface model. Later on, you'll be working on a project called ABL project. ABL is a software that can handle a swept wing. You can have a taper, no problem. You can have twist, there's no problem. So this theory allowed, therefore, the designers to design unswept, tapered, twisted wings. By this time, you know, the engines were not very powerful, so they were not flying subsonically, definitely not transonically. There was no need to sweep the wing. So they were happy with this particular theory. The wings were straight. Uh, you know, they were not swept back at all or swept forward, so it was okay. So this is what uh, the Lanchester theory and also panel theory is dealing with. First thing to notice is uh, the wings, finite wings, right where the wing tip ends, you start getting these tip vortices. You could see the tip vortex structures, you could see the uh, pair of uh, vortices, one from one wing tip, other one from another wing tip, uh, in a cloudy and behind the cloud. If a crop duster plane is landing, you know, you will see this big giant swirling tip vortices. Also, sometimes on a certain, on a clear day, when you look up a plane flying over your head, you'll see from the wing tip, two contrails coming. Contrails is condensation trail. What's happening is you are generating tip vortices at the wing tip. There's a tremendous velocity at the core of the, uh, or core of these vortices. Remember in our 2D vortex theory, velocity is gamma over 2 pi r. When r goes to zero, the velocity, tangential velocity, gets very, very high. When the velocity goes so high, temperature drops, then water droplets form. Then that's what we are seeing. When the sun reflects off the, uh, the droplets, we are seeing that overhead. Sometimes we also see condensation trail from the engines because there's a lot of water vapor from the engine. When they condense, they get uh, reflected. The sunlight is what we see as a condensation trail. Anyways, the my main thing is there is a vortex forming near the wing tip, another one forming near the other wing tip. What causes this uh, vortices? This is a model that was tested in a wind tunnel. This is the actual model. We are looking at it from behind the wing and behind the geometry. So the air, the wind tunnel flow is coming towards us. This is a cross section of flow. So we are slicing right across in the wake. We are looking at what type of velocity we get. We see this is swirling velocity in the vicinity of the vortex. By the way, this swirling the velocity and the vortex, they can last for miles. They will not easily dissipate a decay, mix with the other flow and dissipate. So if there's another plane coming in its wake, it may get uh, buffeted by the tip vortices from the airplane in front of it. Especially if the second plane is a light, a smaller plane, let's say like a Boeing 737. If it's in the wake of a jumbo jet, 
then it will see it will feel unsteadiness bumpiness so in in flight you can avoid it you can climb to a different altitude or move laterally and avoid wake wake interaction but during takeoff if a small airplane takes off right behind a uh, big airplane then the small airplane will be the uh, may encounter these vortices these vortices will produce a huge upward directed velocity on one side and downward directed velocity on the other side within a short distance so if the small airplane is in that wake it will feel uh, all kind of rolling moments it may actually tip over and crash so that's why you need a separation distance during a takeoff that's why uh, they, they don't let the planes take off one after the other they let until the previous airplane has cleared enough distance the vortices have dissipated before the next one can take off. So there's a lot of research going on in understanding what happens to the vortices, how long they persist, how long they last. Professor Karen Fai and I have done some work for FAA through NASA on computational modeling of tip vortex structures. Now, this is the tip vortex structure. Notice that because they are swirling, they are producing a downward directed flow over the wing. We call that a downwash. It's coming from the above the wing towards the wing, and then it goes, you know, the, in the wake structure, you also see it uh, downward directed. What causes these vortices? Well, on the bottom side of the wing, you have higher pressure. On the top side of the wing, we have lower side of pressure. After all, you have an airfoil. On one side, we have lower pressure. On the other side, you have upper pressure. It's the pressure difference that causes lift, so it's a good thing. But right near the wing tip, there cannot be any pressure difference because the, the wing ends right here. So the pressure above must equal pressure below. So what happens is the high pressure air rushes and then occupies the space on the upper surface, equalizing the pressure. It's like a high pressure air from a tube leaking out until the tube pressure equals the pressure of the atmosphere happens in our car tires, happens in our balloon. So here it's happening naturally. High pressure air flows around the tip. So the lift is right and the tip is zero because the pressure equalization occurs. So this rushing air is what produces this vortex. This vortex is what produces this downwash. So these are the things people have observed. So Prandtl and the Lanchester, both of them, the developing model based on this observation. We will stop calling a prandtl lanchester theory. We will start calling it Prandtl's theory from this point on. No dis disrespect for Lanchester. It's just Prandtl's way of formulation is more well-known and more widely known. So what does the downwash do? So here we have the free stream velocity coming this way in 2D flow. This is all we have, free stream velocity. So the lift is normal to this horizontal flow. There's no backward directed force except the viscous drag. But if you now add a downward directed velocity vector to this horizontal velocity vector, so take a horizontal velocity vector that's going from left to right, vectorially add a downward directed velocity vector for the downwash. Now this is the new velocity vector. Now the lift is now is pointed perpendicular to this new line, so the lift vector is tilted backwards. So the lift vector has rotated back towards the wake structure. So the lift now has got a vertical component which holds up the airplane, which we like. Unfortunately, it's got an extra cord-based component, free stream component, which we call the induced drag. Induced means cost. So it's induced by the tip vortex structures caused by the downwash. So we call the induced drag. This is why we get an extra amount of drag that causes the airplanes to have experience higher drag than a 2D theory alone will give. So we are going to develop a mathematical expression for it. It'll have an induced drag equal to that coefficient equal to lift coefficient squared divided by pi times aspect ratio times the yeah, parameter that depends on the twist, taper, aspect ratio, several other parameters. 
So we are just going to call it an efficiency factor. If it is one, you get the lowest induced drag. If anything less than one, you're going to get a higher induced drag. So this efficiency factor is called the Oswald efficiency factor. So we are going to start modeling it. So we are going to use a panels model. So let's say this is what uh, happens physically. So if you take a fluent, which is a software available in our course here to everyone at Georgia Tech, you are modeling the entire flow field. By the way, this fall, I can give you some research opportunities, one hour credit for if you want to learn fluent, just contact me at the beginning of the fall, we can set you up. You're modeling all the details of the flow. So when the thin aerofoil was developed, as we saw in chapter four, we ignore the thickness of the aerofoil because the thickness is small. We only model the camber line. Even the camber line, we distribute the vortices along the x-axis because the displacement of the camber line from the x-axis is small. Okay. So that's what was done in chapter four. Prandtl said uh, in 1917, this is too much, too much detail. I cannot distribute things all along the x-axis. I'm just going to put one lump to vortex right at the quarter card line. So he called, that's the vortex. This is called the bound vortex because it's bound over the, uh, over the, over the wing. Okay. So this vortex strength is going to be the same as the integrated vortex T along this camber line from our 2D theory. This is going to be the same circulation. You know, you remember gamma is nothing more than circulation. So if you put a box around it and measure it, either from an experiment or from a CFT simulation, you get the same circulation. So all these details are buried in one this simple looking picture of a point in the quarter card line and there's a vortex. So that vortex was called gamma. So you do this at every span station from one wing tip to another wing tip. So you have a distribution of vortices, gamma, as a function of y, where y goes from one wing tip to another wing tip. So this is how the picture looks like. So this is one wing tip. I'm going to put the origin right here. So we are going to call this a y-axis. So the total distance from wing tip to wing tip is b, lowercase b. So one half of it is minus of b over 2 to plus of b over 2. So we are going to integrate the lift due to each one of these vertices from a wing tip to wing tip to get the total wing, wing tip, wing lift. So the primary unknown in Prandtl's formulation is the circulation gamma. Gamma has got a, a units of velocity times distance because it's V dot ds around a closed contour as we saw in our building blocks lectures, uh, chapter three lectures some time ago. As soon as Prandtl did this, people started raising uh, questions. Remember, vortex is vorticity, a lot of vorticity lumped in one place for mathematical convenience here. That means we have fluid particles that are that they have a rotating. They have some angular momentum. How can angular momentum abruptly start at one point and abruptly end at another point? Rate of change of angular momentum is some kind of a torque. So there's nothing physically model in panels about a torque like force. Also, how does it change from point A to point B when you change the angular momentum? What caused that angular momentum? So that was one of the problems that they had. So the uh, panel said, I'm going to do the following. I agree with you. This is an objectionable model that I have drawn here. By the way, he called this a lifting line because all the lift is uh, lumped along this line from wing tip to wing tip along the quarter card line. Because it's an unswept wing, this line is along the y-axis. It's not swept back, it's not swept forward, it's parallel to the y-axis. So Prandtl said, uh, this is the mathematical theorem. Helmholtz theorem says vortex cannot abruptly start and end in space. Its strength cannot change from one point to the other. 
So Prandtl's model I showed you here was not good. So Prandtl said, I'm going to modify it. Whenever the vortex length changes, I'm going to put a vortex here that either brings in the circulation, angular momentum or circulation, or takes away angular momentum or circulation. So I'm going to put these vortices, I'm going to call these trailing vortices. And then the trailing vortices are have to end somewhere where the airplane started taking off. So this is my starting vortex. Notice the sense of rotation of these. This is coming from the outboard, inboard. So it's spinning clockwise. So these vortices, one of the vortices that you see as tip vortex when the plane is flying over your head. This is another tip vortex that you see. This flow is going from outboard to inboard from beyond the wing tip into the wing downward directed. There are also several weak vortices. We don't see them because they're very, very weak in strength. But anytime something changes, you have to generate a vortex. So this was the model that Prandtl came up with. As soon as he developed this type of a visualization, all the arguments that they had made here were satisfied. People were happy with it, so they said, okay, let's go with this model. So now we are going to develop uh, mathematical expressions for it. So in a few minutes, we are going to take a break from this video, and then uh, we are going to continue with the math, a couple of more videos, 20, 30 minutes each, to come up with the complete theory. To summarize what we have learned so far, the lifting line th model or the theory we are going to develop is developed by Prandtl in Germany, and also by Lanchester in England. So Prandtl assumed that at each span location, all the vorticity over the aerofoil is lumped in a one point at the quarter card point. The strength of that vortex is gamma. The magnitude of the gamma will change from point to point to point. Therefore, gamma is a function of y. A line may be joined all the quarter card points this line will be parallel to the y-axis, so we call that a lifting line. It will not be swept backward, it will not be swept forward, it will be perpendicular to your x-axis. By the way, x-axis is the flow direction. So in this picture, this is your x-axis from the wing to the far wake. This is your span, this is your y-axis. right hand corner system means the z is in this third direction. So the lift is along the Z direction. Okay, this is the picture. So the wing is unswept, it's parallel to the Y axis. So this is where we are going to stop. It's at 30 minutes already. So we will continue with the additional video which concentrates on the mathematics shortly.